Welcome to Goober Town Hobbies, my name is Brent. Today's video is meant as a resource for newer painters. It's a tutorial where I assume no prior knowledge. We're gonna build and paint some minis, and I'm gonna show you the stuff that I wish I knew when I was getting started. Okay, let's get to it. I love it when people tell me that they're starting to paint minis. This is a great hobby, and it's something that anyone can enjoy. I want tutorials like this one to be accessible and useful to everyone. My target audience for this video is myself from 1998, the kid who's on his way home with his first box of Warhammer minis. If I could send one how-to video back in time to that guy, this is that video. It has all the stuff that I wish someone would have taught me back when I was getting started. First tip, support your local game store whenever you can. This is a great place to learn more about the hobby, meet people, and have fun. And of course, it's the place to go when you need a new paint color right now. I bought the Godsworn Hunt Crew from Warhammer Underworlds. This is a board game from Games Workshop with a low model count. These boxes have a complete team of minis with their rules cards for 30 bucks. The first step in assembling these models is to get those bits off of the sprues. Use hobby clippers and put the flat edge of the jaws close to, but not quite flush with, the bit you want. Then, snip it away. If the models are complicated, then it's worth actually paying attention to the instructions and the little numbers printed on the sprues. Be careful not to clip so many bits at once that you forget what's what. Once the bits are off, you can clean them up with a hobby knife. Use the sharp end to carefully slice off the nubs from the attachment points. Be careful not to cut into the model or into yourself. Then, scrape the knife backwards along any mold lines that you see to remove them. I find that it's easier to do this before the model is assembled. If you're working with a model that has these push-fit pins, I recommend that you cut them off and actually glue the pieces together. Sometimes these pins can prevent you from getting a really good fit. Okay, it's time to glue. Super glue is an option for models of any material, but for plastic models made from polystyrene like these ones are, I like to use plastic glue or plastic cement. What I'm using in this video is Tamiya Extra Thin, but there are tons of brands that do the exact same thing. The plastic cement slightly dissolves the plastic so that the two pieces will meld together. Be careful not to get any fingerprints in the soft plastic. Hold the two bits firmly together for a minute or two until they stick. If you're impatient like me, a couple of tiny clamps can be a really useful addition to your hobby desk. I assembled and glued the whole team. One exception is that I didn't glue them to their bases yet. I just used the push fit pins for now. That will make the bases easier to paint later on. Now it's time to prime our models. I'm using spray paint for this, but there are brush-on options available too if you don't want to use a spray can. Go outside and use double-sided tape or poster putty to stick the models to a piece of wood or cardboard or plastic or something. The spray paint I'm using is primer from the hardware store. This stuff works just as well as the more expensive stuff. Any bottle of spray primer can give a good prime, and any bottle can give a bad prime. Here are some guidelines. Save your priming for a low humidity day. Preferably, this will be a warm day also, but it's more important that the can is warm than that the air temperature outside is warm. Make sure to really give the spray can a good shake. The goal is to build up some light dustings of paint on the model. Start the spray away from the models and then sweep past the targets. Many light dustings is better than one heavy coat. Don't spray so much that actual liquid builds up on the models. A heavy buildup of paint can obscure details. Worse, the solvents and spray paint can dissolve model plastic and make things look melty. The goal is for the solvent to evaporate in the air. It's okay to prime using two or three extremely light coats with 20 minutes of dry time in between. If it's cold out, bring the models inside to dry. Bring the can inside also to keep it warm. Here's a fun tip. Although we primed in black, I'm going to give a quick squirt of white paint from directly above. This is called zenithal priming, and you'll see why it's useful in just a moment. It's time to get ready for brush painting. I highly recommend that you get some handles to help you hold your minis while you paint them. 
You can use empty bottles or blocks of wood with a bit of double-sided tape or poster putty. Several companies even sell handles that are designed for painting minis. My personal favorite is to glue magnets onto the bottom of my minis. Find yourself some handles, there's tons of good options. For this project, I decided to use paints from this Vallejo Game Color Introduction Box. These paints are made specifically for painting miniatures. There are several companies that make paint for minis. Vallejo is one of my favorites because they have been around for a long time without changing their formula. They have a large product line, and they come in these handy dropper bottles. Just drop the paint onto your palette and get to work. Okay, one more bit of preparation before we get going here. I recommend that everyone use a wet palette. Acrylic paint for minis dries quickly, so using a regular plate as a palette is not ideal. A wet palette is just a damp piece of paper with water reservoir underneath. You can buy them or make them yourself. The homemade version is just a sandwich box with a wet paper towel and a piece of parchment paper on top. I like to get everything wet, then squeegee out the extra water. We're just going for damp. The paint sits on the parchment paper, and water seeping up from underneath keeps it useful for a long time. All this preparation is about to pay off. Let's grab some brushes and get to work. In this video, I'm using these multi-pack craft brushes. I think these were $4 per pack at Walmart. Brushes come in a variety of price points, but these will do just fine for today. That being said, if you're at your local game store and they have a brush with the perfect tip, you should buy it. So I'm going to paint the five barbarians in this video and save their dog for later. Painting similar models in a batch can be really efficient. You can go through one color at a time, assembly line style, and by the time you're done painting one color on the last mini, the first mini should be completely dry and ready for the next color. Skin tone is a good color to start with since there is a lot of it on these models. I decided to give these five all different skin tones. There's only one color labeled as a skin tone in the paint set, but that's okay. My next tip is that you shouldn't be afraid to mix colors. The wet palette that we just set up is going to make this super easy. On the wet palette, I'm making combinations of the skin tone, beige, and browns that came in the paint set. I'm even trying to light gray and a little bit of red. I was able to make a bunch of colors that are real human skin tones. The nice thing about the wet palette is that it will keep my mixtures fresh and viable for the next day or two, so I have a lot of time to use them. If I really like any of the colors that I find, it's a good idea to write down how many drops of each paint went into my favorites. Then I can mix them up fresh whenever I want. Okay, finally it's time to paint. I use a wet brush to pick up paint from the wet palette. Most paints are too thick out of the bottle. If they're not thinned down a little bit, they'll leave a globby texture on the model with big ugly brush strokes. A good solution is to water down our paints a little bit and to apply two thin, smooth layers instead of one thick layer. All paints are translucent to various degrees, so it's completely normal that a single thin coat will show the layers beneath. Even several thin coats will have a hint of the underlying color. This is one reason why we did the zenithal highlight. When one of these barbarians is standing out in the sun, some of their skin will be well lit, and other parts will be poorly lit or shadowed. That squirt of white primer gives a rough indication of where sunshine will land on these characters. When we paint over the primer layer, some of our translucent flesh tone will be over white, some will be over black, and some will be over gray. The difference in the resulting colors is subtle, but it's there, and it gives a realistic effect. If you primed your models only with white, the whole model would look brighter when it was painted. If you primed only in black, it would look darker when painted. If you only use a single color to prime with, light gray or tan are actually pretty good choices. I really like this zenithal priming technique though, and there's no reason that a beginner can't do it. That simple squirt of white primer does a lot of work for us. The zenithal highlight is also useful just to help us see all the details on these models. If these models had been primed in a single solid color, it would be harder to see all the different items strapped to these barbarians. The white picks out some details, and it lets me see what each bit is sculpted to be. 
This way, as I'm painting the flesh, I'm also noticing those other details, and I'm thinking about what colors I want to make them. When deciding which order to paint colors, remember that you can be a bit messy with the first colors that you paint, but for the later colors, you'll have to be more and more careful to color inside the lines. This is one reason that I like to paint flesh first. It's all over the place, and it's also underneath every other object on the model. So carefully painting it all in at a later stage might be a bit tricky. Okay, here we are after one coat of flesh tone. And here we are after two coats of flesh tone. The next color I painted is black. I'm using this for some armor, and also for the big sword and axe. I chose to paint black at this point because it's a good undercoat for painting metallic steel or silver. Next up, I want to paint the steel on the sword and the axe. To do this, I'm going to use a technique called dry brushing. Dip a big brush that you don't care much about in paint, and then wipe most of the paint off onto a paper towel. Then, if you start brushing the model with this brush, each stroke will leave a tiny amount of paint behind. I'm dry brushing the axe and the sword the steel metallic color. Metallic paints don't actually contain metal. They're a combination of a regular color, like grey or yellow, plus some mica dust to make it all shiny. The mica dust and the paint medium used to suspend the mica dust makes metallic paints more fickle than other paints, and we have to worry more about them getting glommed up, especially in big flat areas. Dry brushing is a good way to avoid this. After a while, we've deposited a nice thin layer of steel on the sword blade and the axe head. I like to do dry brushing steps relatively early in the painting because they can be a little bit messy. Next color up is red. You can paint your models any colors you want. I figured red is a good accent color for Chaos Barbarians. I put it on their boot fur and their hair. As a general rule, models tend to look nicer when colors are spread around a little bit. Having red only on the boot fur might make the composition look imbalanced. Having the same shade of red on their boots and on their hair doesn't completely make sense, but it sure does balance out the models. I figure that maybe this crew dyes their hair. I'll show you some tricks later on to make these two reds appear slightly different. For the cloth, I painted grey. These models have more muscles than they have clothes, but they all have a grey loincloth at least. Cloth can be dyed any color, but I chose a neutral color for it because I didn't want it to detract from the red and the black. I'm using as many neutral colors as I can on these intervening bits. Next, the leather and wood parts got painted brown. This paint set didn't have a purple, but it did have two browns. This actually makes a lot of sense. Brown is a very common color on minis, and sometimes it's handy to have two shades. For example, when a belt has a pouch hanging off it, or a quiver is packed full of arrows, it's handy to have two shades of brown. I'm making this medium beastie brown the primary brown, and I'm saving the leather brown color for those places where I really need a second shade. I'm also using brown as an undercoat for metallic gold paint. All paint is at least partially translucent, so learning what colors are good base colors is really useful. Brown is a great color underneath gold. I thought I was going to use a mix of gold and steel for the various metallic knickknacks, but I ended up really liking how the gold looked alongside the red and the black on these models. So I ended up painting almost all the metallic details gold. It's nice to have somewhat of a plan for your color scheme when you're going into a project, but if you discover something that you like better along the way, go with it. Part of the fun of this hobby is trying new things and ending up in unexpected places. I'm running low on details now. Time to paint in the bone. Now that the primer is mostly covered with paint, I'm really starting to notice what details are left. As a side note, I haven't gone back to fix any errors yet. Everything has been a single pass. Maybe two coats of a color, but I haven't gone backwards. If you go back to fix errors after every color, you'll never get anywhere. Don't worry, there will be time for neatening up here soon. One of the last colors I used on the figures was the blue for this cloak. Like I said, I want the core colors of the team to be red and black, 
and the blue really does change how this character presents. I'm okay with that in this case though, because she seems to be the leader, and as a mage, it makes sense for her to have a magic cloak that she found in some far off land. For a lot of colors, I've been using two thin coats, but you'll find that each color behaves differently. Yellow colors, for example, are almost always highly transparent, while blues tend to give excellent coverage. I only needed one coat of paint for this blue cloak. This isn't related to the brand of paint, this is simply a matter of what pigment molecules are available to manufacturers. There are tons of great pigments available for blue, and less good choices for yellow. Okay, it's time to paint the bases. Since I didn't glue the figures to their bases yet, I pulled them off to make things easier. I love painting bases, it makes the models suddenly look much closer to being complete. A lot of times, I'll save this step as a little treat for myself. Good colors for bases cause the mini to stand out while also giving them context. These bases would have made sense as a wasteland in a brown or a gray, but making them green makes the red really pop. I'm making them a subdued, dark, swampy green because that fits with the wasteland theme, but also because I don't want the base to pull attention from the figure themselves, so darker is better in that respect. The set didn't come with this color of green, so I mixed in the darkest green that it did have with brown and black. Another reason to start with a nice dark green is because it leaves room for highlights, and I am planning to dry brush on some highlights. I put a lighter green onto my brush, wiped most of it off onto a paper towel, and then dry brushed the base. When you dry brush a piece with a lot of texture, the paint gets left on the high points. So in this case, the dark green remains on most of the base, but the raised texture gets highlighted with the lighter color. Then, I did this dry brush highlighting step again with an even lighter green, this time the goblin green from the paint set. This highlighting adds some depth to the swamp texture and makes it look more realistic. Again, I do dry brushing before other steps because it's messy. So next, I'm doing the details on the bases. I still don't need to be too careful here. This is a swamp and all of the debris is blending in with the muck. Also, if you're doing things right, people won't be paying that much attention to the base. The focus should really be on the figure's face, and the base is just there to give a little bit of context and background. So quickly, I put on brown for the logs, gray for the stones, beige for the old skulls and bones, and then leather brown for the piles of moss. Now that the base is painted, I glued the models into their final position. Super glue is good for this. Getting the base painted really does make the models look closer to completion, and now is a great time to go through and fix up the models. All of my colors are still conveniently fresh on my wet palette, so it was easy to go through the figures one by one and fix any place that still had exposed primer or just needed a touch up. At this point, all of the core colors are on the models, but there isn't much in the way of shading or highlighting, and we're missing out on tiny details such as the eyes. Most folks would say that these models have been base coated. What we just got through is one of the more time consuming parts of the process, and the models are only now just starting to look like tiny people. From here on out, each step is going to be a lot of fun because it's going to add a lot of character to these minis. I also checked to make sure that I still liked the color composition. In this case, I'm liking the red, gold, and black thing that we have going on. I think these colors are distributed pretty nicely around each model. And if I didn't like something, I could absolutely go and repaint it. The next stage in the process is going to be washing and shading, so all of the colors will naturally darken. If you think that some of the colors are currently too light and too bright, the red for example, don't worry, we're about to fix that. Okay, let's pull out some washes. Washes are like very thin paints that run into the crevices of the model. I'm going outside of that Vallejo paint set and pulling in some Games Workshop shades and Army Painter tones. Realistically, I only needed one or two of these, but I wanted to show you the difference between them. I started with Agrax Earthshade from Games Workshop. This is a brown color. I used it on the bases and on the red tassels and hair. You can see how it runs down to the low points and the deepest crevices. 
It darkens everything by a shade or two, but what's important is that it really darkens those deep points, adding definition and depth. It's making the reds look more real, while also making them a darker, more reasonable color. I also use this Agrax Earth shade on a lot of the gold bits. Brown is a good wash color for gold. Nuln Oil is a black wash from Games Workshop, and it's particularly good for steel metallic bits. For the cloth and the flesh, I switched to Army Painter Shades. The Games Workshop formulation is runny and really penetrates well, whereas the Army Painter formulation is thicker and oozes. I like Army Painter more when the recesses are shallower and the high points are more like gentle curves. These barbarians are jacked, but they aren't shredded. They're yoked, but they aren't really cut. They've got incredible size, but their body fat percentage is still double digits. Extreme muscle definition just isn't quite there. I might use Citadel Shade on Bruce Lee, but I like Army Painter better for Vin Diesel. I use the Army Painter washes for this sort of stuff because I think it gives a smoother transition of color. I have a couple of different brownish tones from Army Painter, depending on the flesh color. For some of the Barbarians, I used Flesh Shade, which is a reddish brown. For others, I used Strong Tone, which is a very dark brown. For the Pale Mage and the Cloth, I used Light Tone, which is a light brown. A dark wash over a light base coat can really dominate it. Strong Tone on the lightly colored cloth or the Fair Skin Mage would be pretty aggressive, and it might not come out looking great. That's why I'm being careful to use a lighter wash on lighter skin. Adding washes to models is such a gratifying step. It instantly adds that depth and definition that make the minis come to life, and it requires very little effort to do. As far as skill goes, I'm spending some time making sure that I'm not leaving any big pools. These will leave weird splotches when they dry. Other than that, I'm just letting the washes do what they want to do. I also put some blue tone on the cape. I actually did this to show you something that you probably shouldn't do. On these wide areas with gentle curves, using a wash is more likely to cause splotchy staining than to do anything appealing. In this case, I was able to control it reasonably well, and it didn't make the cape worse, but it didn't make it better either. Washes make a lot of things better, but they really don't help with wide open areas. So a base coat plus some washes brings us to a really fun place. This is a perfectly legitimate time to call a model done and either put it on your shelf or play some games with it. Let's go a little bit farther though and see where we end up. Let's start by making that dyed hair color look a little different from the boot tassels. I'm going to use dry brushing again to do some highlighting. I'm starting with fresh from the bottle red. This is a good place to start since the red on the model has all been darkened by the washes. Then I could start highlighting that red even further. Generally, mixing white with a base color gives a good color to highlight with. So you could highlight red with pink. Mixing yellow with some colors is another way to highlight them. This works well for green, red, and orange. In this case, I'm highlighting the hair with a dry brush of orange. Then. I'm going in with a dry brush of pure yellow. I think this is giving a fun, crazy, barbarian tribe look, which is exactly what I'm going for. Next, I'm going to use the 16th and final color in this Vallejo box set, silver. Metallic colors can be highlighted too. In this case, I'm dry brushing just a bit of silver over the dark steel of the sword and the battle axe. If I were going to take these models to a really high standard, I would go through and highlight every color. I would try to make sure that the parts getting hit by the sun were several shades lighter than the sections of the model in shadow. But I think these models are very close to being ready for the table, so let's forge ahead with a few last details. Paint the crazy evil eye coming out of this lady's palm. Had a few weirdo details in a few other places. And we're on to the eyes. Eyes. The eyes on these minis are tiny, and they are the hardest thing that I'm going to do in this tutorial. Eyes are so important. Our brains are trained to look at the eyes of any person or any creature that we meet. We've learned to read so much in the shape, 
the focus, the dilation, and the direction of someone's eyes. Painting eyes on these models will instantly define their characters, and they are so very, very small. I need to get truly prepared to paint these tiny details. I need to be at the proper level of rest and caffeination so that my eyes focus properly and that my hands don't shake. I'm a coffee drinker, so about half a cup in the tank is appropriate for me. I need to have a tiny brush with a sharp tip, and I need to have bright lights. I need to pay attention to my posture. For painting minis in general, you need to find a comfortable, ergonomic posture that allows you to stabilize your hands and see your work. Here are two suggestions. Sit up straight, elbows on the table, heels of your hands pressing into each other and into your painting handle. Or, sometimes I lean back in my chair, bracing my elbows on my ribcage and pressing my hands together. Find something that works for you. I did use the multi-pack brushes for the eyes, but this would have been a great time to pull in a more expensive brush with a really sharp tip. Even with all that advice, eyes are still tiny and we do need a strategy. The strategy that I like is to darken the eye sockets with a bit of wash. Then I add a white oval. Then I add a black dot that takes up most of the oval. I don't try to distinguish between iris and pupil. On something that small, it's really just the contrast between the black and the white that you see, not the colors themselves. Again, dark eye sockets, white oval, black circle. If I make the oval or the circle too big, I like to continue on and then come back at the end with a bit of flesh color to neaten the boundary and see if that makes things turn out okay. The eyes I painted here aren't amazing, but they mostly work. One of the eyes on the mage is a little crazy, but you know what? I'm okay with that. Whole oh, crazy eyes, Thedra. I'm ready to declare victory here. The last thing I'm going to do is to protect our models with some varnish, especially if we're going to be playing with them. Let's seal in all that good work that we did. Brush on varnish exists, but it was a nice day, so I used a spray varnish. Again, throw on light dustings until you get the effect that you want. I start with a gloss varnish. Gloss varnishes give great protection, but that sheen can be a bit much. So I do a second coat with matte varnish. It's good to know that you can always change the sheen of your models if you don't like it. In this case, I'm just dulling that gloss back down to a nice matte. And they're done. For now, at least. There's no reason why I couldn't keep painting over a coat of matte varnish. I might come back to these models someday. I could add a ton of highlights, or maybe draw on some tattoos, who knows? This was a simple paint job, but I think the models came out looking pretty cool. They are absolutely ready for the table, and I would be proud to play a game with this crew. Like I said, I think everything in this video is completely appropriate for a brand new painter. A lot of painters don't learn about wet palettes or zenithal highlighting until later, but these things are super easy to implement, and they really do give you a leg up on your painting journey. I chose these particular models for this tutorial because they're cool, but also because they provided opportunities to demonstrate a variety of techniques. I plan to keep making videos that focus on these foundational skills. I really love it when new people get into the hobby, and I want to do everything I can to help and encourage folks who are just starting out. Please let me know if anyone has suggestions for other techniques that I should be showing to newer painters, or if you have ideas for any particular models that would be good for this sort of thing. And if you're a new painter yourself, hit me up with your questions. I'll do my best to answer them individually, or even make some videos if there's a lot of interest in a particular topic. One more thing before I close. This painting hobby of ours is a ton of fun. It's a long road and there's no end, but you'll be surprised at how much progress you make over the years and how good you get. Be proud of each mini you paint and be proud of your progress. If you still have the very first model that you ever painted, or if you're about to paint your very first model, save it. Don't ever sell it, don't give it away, don't lose it, and don't repaint it. Save it. Someday you'll want to look back and see how far you've come. Well, there we go. This video was a lot of fun to make, and I do hope that it was useful. If you liked it, do me a favor, like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. 
More importantly this time, if you know a newer painter who might find this video helpful, share it with them. That would be amazing. Okay, that's it. That's all for this time. Thank you so much for watching.